we shall start with module 10 today that deals with masonry material. So, first we will discuss with the, about the materials and as we shall see uh, the from basic definition of the masonry it has got two things one are the units others are the mortars. So, we will look into first units the properties of the units mortar and their properties and that is what we will do today. So, let us see what is masonry let us uh, look at the material itself by definition masonry is an assemblage of masonry units properly bonded with mortar. Let us repeat masonry is a is an assemblage of masonry units properly bonded with mortar. So, that is what it is. So, it has got an assemblage of units and they are bonded with mortar. So, let us see how do they look like well common masonry work brick work you might have seen because brick masonry is brick is one of the units kind of units. So, brick masonry you would have heard of. So, you might have seen something like as you can see here. Now, you can see the units as shown this is the units and the joints mortar joints. So, that is makes you see this the units these are the units as is seen units and you know these are the units individual units and the in between you have mortar joints in between you have mortar joints. One thing you can notice here that these joints are not along same not along the same line you see if you have one joint here you have some joint here and joint here they are not all parallel naturally to avoid any weak planes anyway. So, that is by definition uh, so that is the definition of there is the definition of masonry. So, now we can look into how this what these units are various, various types of units. You can have several types of units and it is a very very traditional construction I mean from right from prehistoric states uh, all, all old constructions are actually made of masonry very early constructions are all stone masonries because you can have stones and you know, as of different kind of uh, stones in regular size unit dressed up stones or even even rumble masonry which is not dressed up stones, but stones joined in mortar. So, that is all prehistoric and even historic monuments they are made of this kind of structure. So, that is very very old you know there is the easiest thing to make first you just have stones and then support the stones I mean support some stones on other stones that must have been the first kind of uh, construction. And then in later on uh, the masonry came you have pieces of stone join them by some sort of joining material and you know we said that volcanic ashes with lime or uh, some burnt clay with lime that was found out to be a kind of pozzolanic material and the mortar could be made out of this mixing with sand. So, all, all your old monuments and structures would be made of those. So, you join stones with such kind of uh, mortar and that makes your masonry structures. So, that is the concept of masonry structures. Of course, now you talk of regular masonries and for many many years burnt clay products have been used as masonry units. Even today commonly used burnt clay building bricks they are the masonry units. Stones I have already mentioned in regular size dressed up still they are used various very much in use particularly in places like Rajasthan particularly in places like Rajasthan uh, where stones are available in plenty. Okay, you can have calcium silicate bricks, sand lime bricks, fly ash bricks you see the, the one point I would like to make in the very beginning this burnt clay building bricks well they, they are a lot of high energy intensive uh, product you burn them at high temperature as we shall see later on and therefore, you consume a lot of energy. So, also you use actually agricultural soil clay for making this material. So, your agricultural land the clay that is useful for agricultural purpose you use that. So, this is not a very very sustainable option really although still we use burnt clay bricks and it is very very popular, but it is not really a very sustainable proposition because you are first of all using agricultural lands and land and secondly uh, you are you are using lot of energy in, in production of those units. So, although still they are popular 
but likely to come are fly ash bricks. So where you can have fly ash together with sand and lime is one kind or maybe make use make use of fly ash concrete blocks, aerated fly ash concrete blocks and several combinations are possible. So use of fly ash in large scale brick production right uh, is uh, now going on and fly ash bricks which would mean that they would come from fly ash lime bricks like concrete and similar sort of thing. Concrete blocks have been used as masonry both solid and hollow and you can have bricks also hollow uh, and uh, things like that right. Then you have got autoclaved cellular concrete blocks these are some of those examples as I said autoclaved, autoclaved cellular blocks are very low density um, concrete blocks we will discuss about them how they are produced some of them at height and cured at high temperature and pressure and uh, uh, these blocks are uh, also used as uh, masonry units. So uh, this is uh, the other, other type and they have very low thermal conductivity, they have very low thermal conductivity. So that from that point of view they are good, they can, they have very good insulation properties. So as you shall see this masonry is mostly we use them in wall and in wall some cases you need good thermal acoustics properties and so on and we will discuss this properties somewhat and autoclave cellular concrete blocks serves those kind of purpose for such masonry structures. So that is what are the type of block units there can be several other types and uh, then how do you desi designate especially the load bearing masonries? There can be several types of class designation but uh, for, for structural purpose particularly the one who use load bearing masonry we shall define what is load bearing masonry obviously when I say something like load bearing masonry exists there must be non load bearing masonry also we will look into those later on but they are classified according to the designation you know class designations are based on their average compressive strength. So you look into the compressive strength of the unit mostly we test the bricks flat on you know blocks or bricks test flat on uh, that means the largest surface area is placed onto the uh, testing machine same compression testing machine which we used actually for concrete uh, cube testing same machine and test them flat on and uh, uh, they are designated according to the standard test procedure whatever compressive strength you get. So that can vary from possibly even 3.5 to you know up to 40 MPa. So in India of course it is not very common to get clay bricks 40 MPa you get 10 MPa at best one to, uh, maybe 12 MPa but 40 MPa bricks uh, can are available or concrete blocks you can make of that uh, that kind of you know that kind of strength. So your masonry strength can go as high as 40 MPa right. So that is the masonry right. So let us look at some more things of the uh, clay bricks let us say. Burnt clay building blocks bricks you know so that is that is what is the thing and how do we produce it. This ones we produce this one we produce from clay and you know what is clay, clay is nothing but silica and alumina, clay is nothing but silica and alumina SiO2 and Al2O3. This is first mixed with water, tempered with water to produce required plastic plasticity. So you add sufficient water with the clay and so that it becomes plastic right, it just becomes plastic and so that you can mold it. So it is first made plastic then in this process actually water forms a film around the flaky clay particles, clay particles are flaky. So they can absorb water at their surface and forms a uh, film of water around these particles and this results in their parallel orientations. The particles are now parallelly oriented, they will be oriented in parallel direction and which helps in forming you know in, in making or molding and compaction. Since they are parallel they can easily be shared off sort of workability will be more the plastic material it can be easily worked on and it helps in forming. So the adding of water the to clay makes it easy to handle and you know workable uh, as we have understood and uh, we can then compact them. Now once we have compacted then we dry them say there the volume reduction 10 goes by about 10 percent so we dry them and same because there will be a shrinkage when you dry. 
Now this drying is required because if you do not dry it, the shrinkage will be excessive during the next process that we will discuss. So first we dry them, right? And in the process there is some amount of shrinkage because some of the moisture will go out, some of the moisture will go out and and the structures of the clay structures will collapse somewhat because the moisture has gone out, there will be a volume reduction, there is a shrinkage. And then they are fired, so they are fired bricks, you see fired at 900 to 1400 degrees centigrade, of course depending upon type of clay. Fire bricks of course are burnt at much higher temperature, maybe around 1800 degrees centigrade, 1800 degrees centigrade. You see the surface clay is first what we do is we remove the top portion of the clay, the organic matter should not be present in the clay. So if you remove few meters or one or two meters from the top of the sur top surface soil, what you get is surface clay. And this surface clay is formed at relatively lower temperature, right? Whereas the one you go further down below the clay that you got get at lower depth, they are formed, you know, they 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 actually are formed at high temperature. Fire clay, for example, is obtained which contains more alumina. So you obtain it from deeper. So surface clay then shale and then the fire clay. Now all this can be used for brick making, fire clays are usually used for burnt at much, much higher temperature 1800 to even 22 degree centigrade and uh, then they are uh, basically used for refractories. So what we are talking of mostly is the surface clay or the shale bricks you know, prepared from shale or surface clay. These are burnt from about 900 to 1400 degree centigrade. and. Uh, uh, in the process of burning what will happen? Initially of course there will be a phase of water smoking, uh, the water will go away followed by actually what is known as vitrification. So there are solid solutions formed and the new material, material is no longer clay, you have new phases formed in the solid solutions and that is relatively strong with sufficient certain amount of pores in the material because the solid would have formed, solid solution would have formed, the volume has been formed right in the beginning, there could be some shrinkages but the structure has formed. So during the process of vitrification, some you know their, their volume changes takes place and the space originally occupied by water and which was actually got evaporated or left from that place uh, usually would there will be voids will be remaining. So microstructure of concrete will have lot of interconnected porosity pores coming because, uh, because of the you know the water that would go out to leave some connected porosity system and the solids. The solids is actually uh, product of solid solution which is formed during the high temperature and when you have cooled the solid solution solidified you know it has got solidified. So uh, that is that's, that's, that's the product. Of course we are not much interested in the details of brick manufacture because civil engineers are likely to be uh, rarely involved in brick manufacturing process, I mean practically none, nobody but he will be using, I mean one civil engineer is expected to use it. So we look into more of the properties rather than in the manufacture but some idea I, I have tried to give you that uh, how clay bricks are manufactured. Then you have got calcium silicate bricks and this is basically, you see this is basically uh, you might have siliceous material, basically ground sand, grind the sand or siliceous rock to get a kind of siliceous material, to get siliceous material and then use lime, usually could be of the order of around 10 is to 1 or so and these are compacted together to obtain sand lime bricks. So you can, you can or calcium silicate bricks, you know they are, these are compacted together. Quick lime and water actually there should be water, water, these are mixed together you know I mean sand, quick lime and sand are mixed together in excess water required to hydrate lime. So the lime is expected to hydrate, quick lime is calcium oxide which gets hydrated from slacked lime and uh, you know it gets hydrated lime and this is stored for 3 to 24 hours for hydration. So you have mixed, mix the quick lime and sand together in excess of water, quick lime and sand, this is sand, this should be sand, sand together and mixed with excess of water and then you leave it for uh, the lime to hydrate you leave it for lime to hydrate to 3 to 24 hours, then it is remixed again and uh, finally pressed, remixed and pressed and finally can be autoclaved depending upon what you want at high temperature, high pressure and temperature, high pressure and temperature for 4 to 15 hours and that is what results in formation of this variety of bricks. There is another kind of bricks used quite often. Then of course I mentioned that uh, 
fly ash can be used in brick manufacture and that is definitely more sustainable. Now, the moment you autoclave and uh, autoclave at high temperature and pressure again you are using large amount of energy. So, that is also a little bit uh, energy in intensive you have to grind it. Uh, clay bricks were also energy int intensive. So, you can reduce this down somewhat uh, of course, uh, uh, all right you can use uh, fly ash in the calcium silicate bricks uh, instead of instead of using the silica you can use fly ash right and partially replace to produce lime silica fly ash brick also you can use partially you can replace. So, lime and silica lime and fly ash they would some similar purpose the pozzolanic reaction should be available and that would make you make uh, fly ash uh, lime fly ash bricks of course, the strength etc that would depend. You can you can make concrete using fly ash large quantity of fly ash and make blocks out of them. Concrete blocks as such are used for masonry purposes, you know concrete block as such are used as masonries and uh, they can be hollow or solid because hollow would mean that we will have better thermal conductivity. So, they can be hollow or solid, hollow or solid as you wish depending upon uh, the purpose and the masonry they can be used as masonry units. So, concrete and fly ash concrete bricks or blocks can be used very easily for masonry purposes. Now, I mentioned that you can do autoclave product aerated auto, autoclave at aerated concrete blocks. Uh, these are produced these are produced you know by two methods or two types of uh, basically uh, like with you see you have a foaming kind of what you do gas generating in, in such products what you do you actually you add a pro, you add a particular ingredients into the concrete making process which will form bubbles closely you know closed pore system closed pore system of small diameter uh, not very large diameter but small diameter and thereby you can control the density of the concrete itself right you can get from aerated concrete blocks you can get from 200 to possibly 2000 kg per meter cube density of uh, concrete. So, can be obtained from using 0.2 percent finely divided aluminum powder, finely divided aluminum powder by mass of concrete mass mass uh, by mass of cement no no mass of cement in mortar mass of cement in mortar you know mass of cement in mortar. Aluminum reacts with the calcium hydroxide hydrating generating actually hydrogen and this forms the bubble. So, basically uh, mass of cement in mortar and aluminum reacts with calcium hydroxide of the concrete uh, generating and liberating hydrogen and thus forming bubbles. So, these bubbles remain as closed pore system and they essentially bring down the density of the concrete or mortar as you can call it density of the mortar and uh, essentially and this would uh, be good thermal insulation because we will see that density is a you know thermal insulation depend upon density. Higher density means more thermal conductivity less insulation. So, therefore, uh, this is used this can be used you know and judiciously they can be using depending upon their density for both structural as well as thermal and similar other use. This is one way of making aerated blocks. The foam concretes are made with some foaming agent like uh, you know you can you can you can use for example, foam concrete is produced by adding foaming agent like usually they are hydrolyzed protein or resin soap to the mix and they again introduce bubble this one is a soap solution soap solution resin soap for example, they introduce bubble formation because of the surface tension qualities and all that and they form bubbles in the concrete during the high speed mixing during the process of high speed mixing and this foam concrete again has got low density. So, you can get densities from 200 kg to 2000 kg depending upon the situation and you can make use of fly ash in this particular one and replace a part of the cement. So, that is that would be uh, useful situation. What are the properties which are important for the units? First is the compressive strength and as, as I said usually tested flat. Then water absorption is another property which is you know which is actually related to porosity because again porosity dictates the strength of this units. Porosity also dictates the water ingress you know the penetration resistance against moisture ingress that is dependent upon uh, 
uh, porosity. So many properties, most of the properties of the brick would be a function of the porosity, the useful properties of the bricks or masonry units will be function of porosity. So when it comes to stones of course, they have very little porosity, but stone is a naturally available material, you cannot get it everywhere. Other places wherever, whatever the masonry units we are using, their porosity is very, very important. Because lower porosity means higher strength, higher porosity means lower strength, but at the same time higher porosity means better insulation. Closed pore system of course, lowers the strength reduces the I mean do not increase the increase the resistance against moisture ingress. So, if you have closed pore system moisture ingress will be low, but higher porosity is beneficial from thermal properties point of view. Higher porosity if it is interconnected not advantageous from water penetration and obviously porosity of any form will reduce down the strength. Now, a quick measure of the porosity is 24 hours absorption. So, what would be done you oven dry the brick put it in water, distilled water preferably, keep it for 24 hours if not ordinary water also, put it in uh, put it in uh, water for 24 hours and then take its mass. So, difference in mass will give you the percentage with water the mass of the water that has been absorbed and that can be converted into percentage absorption etcetera, etcetera. Of course, if you are if you want to determine the total porosity, uh, then you can put it in for another 48 hours and maybe for another consecutive 24 hours weights when it is not differing by 0.5 percent of the initial weight, then you can see it is fully saturated. You can boil it for about 6 hours, 5 to 6 hours to get the complete moisture absorbed. Anyway, so that is that is another we are finding out total measure of the porosity of the bricks and blocks. Now, uh, absorption is a measure of the porosity, therefore it can be related to property. So, this is a very important property. Earlier crude way of looking at the properties of one clay brick is to find out what is the sound it makes. Supposing you drop it from hand it should not break, drop it certain uh, through some height it should not break, very crude way of uh, looking at the strength of brick sort of you know whether there is a good quality brick on it. Two bricks you hit it should make metallic sound, those are the very very uh, empirical way of looking at the properties of brick, but these are the methodical way of would be absorption. Then another test is suction rate or another property is suction rate, how fast it sucks water because moisture ingress could be related to this. Suction rate means you have, you have, you actually keep the brick vertical, keep the brick vertical, you know, vertical in a tray, you keep the brick vertical in a tray with say about 1 or 2 inch dipped in distilled water and go on measuring its mass with time. So, then you find out the suction rate of this one, uh, suction rate of this particular one brick. So, this should be again relatively low. Then you have moisture expansion, is a swelling does the swelling takes place with uh, bricks, normally it does not, most of them do not. So, you have to see with uh, units of masonry units, whether there is a moisture expansion, should not have swelling in contact with moisture. Efflorescence and soluble salt, you see in the clay there can be some soluble salt, this is burnt clay brick particularly can show some sort of efflorescence. Uh, it can have some soluble salt present in the clay, say sodium sulphate or similar other salts. Now, that has gone into the solid solution all right, but when you subject it to more water, then you know you keep it in water and then dry it, what will happen? You will see white marks of white marks over the surface of the brick and this white marks are nothing, the soluble salt that was there that has got dissolved in the water and come out to the surface, leached out to the surface and as the water evaporated, this actually left the marks right onto the surface. This is aesthetically very, very unpleasant, this is aesthetically very, very unpleasant. So, this is not desirable, although it does not really matter much to the strength of the brick masonry units because you know this efflorescence really create much problem towards uh, um, strength of the brick masonry or its performance in that direction, you know stability and strength related properties, but it is, it is aesthetically very unpleasant. Normally, it takes place once, if it takes regular you know time and again there can be problem, but when it takes once an acid wash where actually these salts will dissolve um, is, is a good solution, you know that you just give a acid wash, wash mild, very dilute acid wash and that takes away the uh, 
scales that is formed. So, efflorescence is rela related to that soluble salt content and efflorescence that is related to that. The test of efflorescence is again put it the brick part of you know a small portion dipped in water vertically up and observe it for couple of uh, later on few days. And do you, if you see salt mark of the mark of the uh, salt marks at the surface you know there is a criteria where significant efflorescence based on the visual observation one can determine whether significant efflorescence is there or not. Now as we shall see later on bricks today are used mostly for mostly as walling material mostly as walling, walling material masonry construction is mostly uh, limited to walling materials these days. So, when it is used as walling material the property that is very important is thermal properties because you see thermal comfort is one of the issues which we discussed right in the beginning uh, of this uh, uh, course uh, the functional, functional uh, mm, properties of various construction. Now one of the thing is that the space should if it is building the space should remain comfortable. So, the temperature should be within controllable limit which may be po may not be possible without any uh, active means we said, but if you are trying to first you must try to you know control it as much as possible through passive means. Now while one to you want do not do not want heat to come into the building or space from outside uh, the thermal properties are very important. In tropical countries we do not want heat to come from outside of course in colder regions they would like no heat from inside to go because you know so that there is a situation when temp outside temperature is very very low and in, in summer in tropical countries you would not want any heat to come inside. Now the properties of the material or the construction that is wall or roof which dictates this is the thermal properties. So thermal properties of the material basically we want us to look into therefore thermal conductivity of bricks or masonry units are very very important. Density is important and specific it is also important because they all relate to thermal properties right. So, these are important properties we shall see that and of course the fire behavior is very important. Now fire behavior uh, because if they are in buildings then this will be important but fortunately one need not worry much about uh, the fire behavior of brick units because most of them are actually burnt at very high, relatively high temperature you know the temperature that one would encounter in fire this material has been produced at such temperature. So, normally nothing happens but something can happen to the mortar that is the jointing material right. Uh, resistance against chemical attack that is very very important but usually the bricks most of the types of bricks are actually uh, resistant clay bricks burnt clay bricks are resistant against chemical attack alkali attack anything of that kind generally they are very strong. But you see if you look at other masonry units then both fire behavior and resistance against chemical attack one has to look into because if it is blocks of the kind of concrete or cementitious you know not fired ceramics but, but it is chemically combined chemically bonded ceramic like concrete where you actually have the bonding is chemical or aerated autoclave system and so on where it is uh, uh, where it is actually chemically bonded then normally it will behave all similarly as the cement hydrate behaves. So, and also the mortar joints would behave in the same manner. So, other units may uh, be susceptible to fire effects. Now, let us uh, see how, how cementitious system is affected by fire. Uh, when you subject cementitious or cement hydrates to fire up to 200 degree centigrade 300 degree centigrade there is no effect because first the water free water will actually evaporate out. Now, this water you know which is just absorbed from the atmosphere or because of the contact of the liquid this goes out by 110 degree centigrade. So, that is not a problem. Now, beyond up to 200, 150 to 200 degree centigrade all such free water will go away. Beyond 200 or 300 degree centigrade then adsorbed water from the surface of the gel structure starts going away evaporating because you know that you require more energy to remove them. So, at 200, 300 degree centigrade this goes away. 
400 degree centigrade onwards this dehydration process continues and it is con you know it continues till about uh, 600 degree centigrade whereby most of the gel waters will actually evaporate out. But at 800 degree centigrade calcium hydroxide gets broken down to calcium oxide. So therefore by that time the cement hydrate would lose all its bonding property and this is irreversible process that means if you put back water reduce down the temperature and put the water back the it does not come back to the cement hydrate state again. So, this is an irreversible process and therefore all cementitious material uh, which are used in masonry units they will behave in the same manner. So, up to 200, 300 degrees centigrade they are fine, but after that the strength reduction starts and its strength gets reduced and at 800 degrees centigrade practically no strength will be left. But one advantageous situation is that these materials are all insulating, relatively insulating, their, their thermal conductivity is quite low, they are low conductivity material compared to say steel. So therefore, heat does not get inside, although the surface might be affected, heat may not go inside so easily. So masonry units which are made of cement based uh, material, they will have uh, similar sort of behavior as I just now mentioned. But uh, chemical attack, same durability issues which are there with respect to cement. So, all cement based masonry units will have similar properties. So, let us look into some details of these properties again. Say, let us say how absorption, because I said absorption is one of the ways of measuring the quality of break and because it is related to compressive strength. So, data shows data of uh, compressive strength versus uh, you know uh, compressive strength versus absorption in this axis I have absorption in this axis I have absorption and this axis I have compressive strength and as I can see as my absor absorption increases as my absorption increases compressive strength decreases down you know these points represents so it in fact I have a curve of something of this kind. So my as my absorption increases something like 30 percent I have 10 MPa strength. Well, this may not be all universal but however this we can understand as absorption increases compressive strength will definitely reduce as absorption increases compressive strength will definitely reduce compressive strength will reduce that is because more pores and also sizes becomes larger more interconnected pore system pore sizes also. So, related to that same idea as absorption increases therefore absorption can be a good test to find out how bricks will behave as far as compressive strength or all other mechanical properties are concerned. Now, you can look into the suction the properties of concrete. If you are looking at moisture ingress into bricks, moisture ingress properties into bricks, how much water they will suck in. This axis is actually water content, this axis is water content, this axis is water content. You see water content along this direction, water content and on this axis is suction pressure, you know suction pressure or suction head, suction hand and when it is wetting moisture content is increasing it follows this path while drying it follows different path. There is a hysteresis if you try to increase the moisture content of bricks or similar other porous materials this is also true for all other similar ceramic or inorganic porous materials. When they are absorbing water the path followed moisture content and suction pressure. Now, suction pressure is a function of capillary size, capillary size. The whole idea is that the capillaries which are filled in while wetting and while it is drying exactly the process is not reversed, path followed are different and therefore you have a hysteresis, therefore you have a hysteresis right uh, while wetting and while drying they do not follow the same path. So, there is a hysteresis and suction rate is important because that would tell us how much water can penetrate into it. It is a basic idea of moisture protection is of course, if you have a barrier it is fine, but if it is not a barrier if you have massive material massive thickness of the wall the moisture penetrates into it, but before it is you know it does not penetrate to its full length before a drying period starts. That means, if this is the wall if this is the wall if this is the moisture front you know the water rain water let us say rain water is uh, hitting it like this. So, this is the wet front will move gradually it will move, move the wet front the, the you know wet front will move like this, but it should not move to the inside surface 
because rain will stop eventually and a drying period will start. So, it should start actually after the drying period, you know the wetting period, during the wetting period the moisture should penetrate, but should not penetrate up to the inner phase. Before that the drying period should start, so that uh, this place there is no, uh, you know there is no, there is no moisture penetration right onto the surface. So, the moisture can penetrate all right, but the rain must stop and drying period must start before it has penetrated right up to the inside surfaces. Now, this property will be function of the suction property and uh, uh, you know moisture ingress property will be function of the suction. Okay, so, that is what is the idea one can do more exercise onto this, but we are not interested in our class to do that. Now, let us look at the property thermal conductivity of bricks and blocks. Generally, traditionally many people have related thermal conductivity to density, uh, many people have related thermal conductivity to density, right. Many people have related thermal conductivity to density. Okay. So, you can relate thermal conductivity to density. past results people have related thermal conductivity to density and as the density increases thermal conductivity also in, increases. The unit of thermal conductivity as you can see is watt meter per degree centigrade. We might look into this a little bit more sometime later on in connection with the wall, uh, but at the moment this is the property and you would have seen this, I mean learned this in your basic school physics. So, thermal conductivity increases as the density increases. This is the amount of heat that would be transferred under steady condition through unit temperature gradient through unit area of the wall, right. This is the heat rate of heat flow through unit area of the material not wall here, the material uh, for unit temperature gradient, for unit temperature gradient. So, higher the thermal conductivity more is the heat conduction, the higher the density more is the heat conduction and you can see several materials here, autoclave aerated concrete blocks, clinker, expanded clay and then sintered P, uh, you know pulverized fuel ash, this again formed into aggregate, you know they are aggregate, this aggregate concrete blocks. So, you can have synthetic aggregate as I mentioned earlier, sintered pulverized fuel ash, you know making from fly ash actually, then vermiculite is another one, foamed slag is the other one from the slag, blast from slag, pumic and so on so forth, gravels and bricks. So, if you use all those as aggregate and then bricks are also there, gravel aggregate and this, this sort of relationship is known to us. So, this is thermal conductivity one way, but fundamentally thermal conductivity is actually related to porosity. One thing is the, I mean of course, the conductivity of the solid and porosity and this is actually results for Indian bricks, most of the Indian bricks or rather um, North Indian bricks mostly and some of the East Indian bricks some from eastern part of the country Calcutta and so on and the mostly largely from North Indian bricks including some fire bricks. So, one can measure the porosity and uh, also measure the uh, thermal conductivity and it has been observed as the porosity increases thermal conductivity de de decreases. And one point I would like to mention here is that uh, you see it is you can see the value orders are about 2.53 not more than that, even concrete would be somewhere, three bricks would be somewhere there. So, this includes concrete also, some concrete, foam concrete, these are all foam concrete, uh, you know, uh, made with soap solution, aerated concrete blocks, autoclaved aerated concrete blocks. So, this is also for bricks, blocks, everything. Bricks, of course, would be somewhere here. Now, you can see the values, they range up to concrete would be up to 3 watt meter degree centigrade, but uh, steel it is 50. So, this is really an insulation material compared to steel. So, that is what I am saying this has got an advantage to uh, from that point of view uh, in the context of fire in normal temperature. Of course, in high temperature the thermal conductivity will change. However, so as porosity increases thermal conductivity reduces and porosity and density are inversely related. Higher the porosity density will be lower. Basically, the mineral materials will have similar thermal conductivity, but it would vary, it would vary depending on for example, quartz has got thermal conductivity of 10 watt meter degree centigrade where many others will have much smaller values. So, thermal conductivity is also function of porosity, but most importantly it is also function of moisture content, you know because water has got a thermal conductivity about 25 times more than that of the that of the uh, more than that of the air. 
So, if your air now is filled with moisture and you saturated the uh, bricks and blocks, then the thermal conductivity will increase significantly. And you can see these values changes, values changes you can see. For example, uh, this is the porosity of the whole range and this now it was starting at 0 0.015 and very small values 3, this is now going to 4 or 5. So, there is some amount of increase in thermal conductivity when moisture comes in. Satur this is saturated situation, even for unsaturated partially saturated condition the moisture causes increase in thermal conductivity. So, uh, moisture is the other factor which controls the thermal conductivity, but anyway that is uh, natural you cannot do much with it. So, porous uh, one if it is interconnected porosity is there moisture comes in its thermal conductivity insulation properties might be lost, but if it is all closed pore systems thermal conductivity will still be intact. So, it will remain intact. Right, some more now when you have fly ash bricks the thermal conductivity would be something like this you know foam concrete with sand as fines and foam concrete with fly ash as fines. So, you have made fly, fly ash see so this is this is the one. So, this is the fly ash ones and this is the uh, this is the foam concrete as sand as fines. So, thermal conductivity changes it shows fly ash actually increases the thermal conductivity little bit with the density again it is plotted, but does not matter. So, fly ash also the it can increase little bit, but does it is still ok if it is formed sufficiently formed that part will take care of. Now, when I am dealing with fire situations of fire the temperature of fire can go up to 1200 degree centigrade you know standard temperature fire of course, can it goes on monotonically increasing, but real fires can go up to 1100, 1200, 1000 degree centigrade fire temperature can go as high as this. So, when you are trying to determine the fire resistance which will define subsequently some time which is defined in terms of time, uh, when you are interested in estimating the fire resistance one would like to know how the thermal conductivity thermal properties changes with temperature, also specificate how does it change with temperature. So, that is what it is specificate against temperature this is how it varies, it does not specificate of normally such material do not vary very much normal condition at ordinary temperature you know it varies from about uh, around 900 uh, joules per kg per degree centigrade or around 0 0.2 uh, kilo calorie per kg per degree centigrade. So, in this in this case uh, this is temperature this axis is you know this axis is this axis is temperature this axis is temperature this axis is temperature axis and this axis is specificate temperature axis and this axis is specificate. So, this is specificate specificate. Now, we can see the specificate is actually in kilo calorie or kilo joules per kg degree centigrade and this value is around 0 0.8 you know I said that around 900 800 900 joules per kg. So, about 0 0.8 0 0.9 joules per kg is normal temperature with temperature higher temperature increases go up to about 1.1 or so or 1100 joules per kg per degree centigrade not a big not a very big big variation, but slightly increases uh, with uh, slightly increases with the uh, temperature, but normally this bricks all types of bricks you know we have seen the thermal conductivity varies quite significantly for varieties of bricks and blocks and so on it varies from about uh, 0 0.015 or 0 0.01 etcetera you know that low thermal conductivity for aerated concrete to about 2 to 3 in case of concrete blocks, uh, whereas specific it does not vary so much it will vary from about point I mean somewhere around 800 joules per kg per degree centigrade to about 900 or at best near about 1000 not more than that. So, this variation is relatively less. So, let us see what happens to thermal conductivity with temperature this also increases a little bit this shows with the density for each density for 700 density you see this thermal conductivity it was about uh, 0 0.16 or so 0 0.16 and then it increased and as the density increases this was uh, this for bricks this is only for bricks uh, this for bricks 0 0.7 and it increased to about 2100 you know to it increased to about uh, 0 0.8 or 0 0.9. So, thermal conductivity also increases with temperature by and large not very significant increase of thermal properties with temperature in when it is exposed to fire. So, these are the other kind of properties that one would look into. Now, let me just put it this way the concrete should have shown a thermal conductivity at ordinary temperature 1 to about 2.5 or 3 depending upon type of aggregate you use. So, concrete blocks 
would show higher thermal conductivity. Bricks normally shows around 0 0.2, 0 0.3 to about 0 0.7, fire bricks would show around 0 0.7, 0 0.8. Uh, flyers bricks will show around 0 0.3, 0 0.4 watt meter degree centigrade and aerated block shows much less, you know 0 0.1 less than 0 0.1. So, these are the range of thermal properties of masonry units. So, let us look into mortar and their properties, right. Now, mortar traditionally I mentioned that it was actually pozzolana, lime pozzolana mortar, lime pozzolana sand mortar. So, today we can have cement sand mortar cement lime sand mortar or lime pozzolana sand mortar. So, all these varieties are possible and we classify them uh, as heavy, medium and light H1, H2, A, M1, M2, M3, L1, L2 on the basis of their 28 days compressive strength and uh, the compressive strength maximum for H1 is 10 MP, 10 MPA and for H you know 2.5 MPA for last one for last one this 0.5 MPA and the Indian standard code which deals with uh, masonry design, load bearing masonry design uh, is 1905, this is the classification here. So, it gives you H1, H2, M1, M3, etcetera, etcetera and the combination the first one would have more amount of more amount of in fact uh, cement and as you go down lesser amount of cement, the strength of course reduces with cement. All right, let us see how, how these are. Now, First thing what properties we are interested in? Strength is a very important parameter as far as uh, mortar is concerned. A strong mortar will have high crushing tensile and shear strength of course, all these properties we need a strong mortar. So, strength is one property. Now, I, I, I got to apply the mortar onto the bricks, I got to apply the mortar onto the bricks therefore, it should be you know normally through a trowel one applies the mortar onto the brick. So, it should hang onto the towel like if you scoop it up it should remain there and should not really flow away, but it should still be I should be able to spread it easily with the towel. So, therefore, the workability, workability of the mortar is important. So, it should be able to you know it should be the one which should I should be able to spread it easily and it should set also not too late. If it sets too late then there is a problem then I have to wait for constructing the another layer because the brickwork construction goes on or the masonry work construction goes on from one layer and then you finish possibly the length of the wall or length of the structural section come back again and just lay another layer right. So, while you are trying to do that it must set quite early if it sets very late maybe one two hours late then you have to wait come back and you cannot put the new masonry onto it. So, it should set reasonably early enough for work to progress at you know progress at a relatively comfortable rate or relatively uh, fast rate, but at the same time it should not stiffen while applying. So, this is important it should be able to retain the water. So, it should not stiffen and this should is done by retaining water. So, it should retain the water it should not totally quickly consume the water by in the reaction process should be able to retain the water for slightly longer period of time at the same time should not have too long of setting time. So, all this all this you know all these properties are desirable. Now, again another problem is if there are too much of water should be held together with the particulate system as a cohesive unit in mortar and should not have lot of you know segregation of water or something. So, when it comes in contact with the brick, brick being porous although we saturate them before laying down brick being porous it should not absorb this water and stiffen my mortar before application. So, that is why the water retention property of the mortar is important you know water retain retention property of the mortar is important because it should not stiffen and uh, better bond if it does not stiffen then it will allow for better bond and better resistance against rain penetration. If a poor bond through the bond rain can penetrate. So, it should have a uh, it should have a good uh, bond and that is water retention property is important at that point. Then low drying shrinkage it should not shrink and uh, should have of course, adequate strength. Now, if you have too much of cement in the uh, too much of cement in the mortar then it will give you good strength all right, but it will have high shrinkage also. On the other hand lime has got good retentivity less shrinkage, but low strength also. So, if you see these properties that we are looking at the properties 
like strength comes higher cement gives you higher strength, but lime gives you better water retention, better workability as well and uh, less drying shrinkage. So a combination of lime cement sand mortar that is good and pozzolana of course helps in that direction as well because pozzolana would retain the water for longer period of time and you have something called masonry cements also which are made out of pozzolana. So uh, well in India of course they may not be much available but earlier PPC are produced which are used only for masonry work. So some of the PPCs you can one can easily work using masonry work because they do not disturb the setting time, strength is sufficient for the mortar and uh, of course uh, the shrinkage is less and it can retain the water also. So these are the properties of the mortar which are desirable properties of the mortar. Right, so we will come to masonry structures, what are the types of masonry structures, but uh, some more issues related to the mortar, you see mortar is after all the cement based material. So its properties will be like cement based material, so when it comes to its, uh, although it, it constitutes relatively small proportion in the brickwork, it does not constitute a very long, a large proportion in the brickwork, but its joints are very, very important because that should not allow moisture to go in. Uh, also the mechanical properties are important in the sense that uh, uh, you see the load is transferred through the joints, load is transferred through the joints and the differential movement, transverse movement between brick and uh, mortar that could be a source of, uh, source of uh, uh, stress, internal stress generation into the brickwork itself. So Poisson's ratios are important, strength is important and shrinkage is, if it shrinks then it will actually uh, kind of uh, introduce or kind of uh, sort of uh, you know induce a kind of tensile stresses into the brick itself, the units itself. So that is why it is important that it has all those properties that we mentioned. Uh, the, the, the material can be sand obviously is common, lime, sand lime, cement or sand cement or pozzolana lime sand, pozzolana lime sand, pozzolana lime sand. So usually pozzolana lime sand is uh, also another combination which is used and can be used effectively for making uh, masonry mortar. So first thing is cement sand mortar, cement sand and lime, cement lime and sand mortar, lime and sand mortar they were also there. And then pozzolana lime sand mortar. So these are the kind of mortars that one can have. Okay. Now where do you use these masonries? You know masonry structures those are there, walls is the most commonly used. You see earlier historically speaking people did not know, know how to use tension carrying material. Sometime earlier I might have mentioned this right in the beginning. So therefore you had all sorts of materials which could take only compressions, arches arches where the load is you know it is mostly the stresses are compressive right it is by the shape by shear shape it can carry the load and the material there is no tension in the arch. So there is compression in the arch um, it will depend upon of course the bottom what is the bottom bottom fixity or what kind of uh, bottom uh, you know uh, fixity is there at the bottom. So whatever it is arches are usually compression, compression taking material so therefore brick masonry was useful there. Then uh, if you want brick masonry to take also some sort of tension then you must reinforce it. So you have reinforced brick masonry, not very popular in this country, but they are there, Many elsewhere it is actually used. Ordinarily we use brick masonry, earlier were used for bridge piers, arches and similar other many other structures, but now it is most commonly used for walls. Um, most common you know is the most common common use is walls and the walls can be of the two kind load bearing and non load bearing. When you have a load bearing wall you can it will carry the load from the slab and transmit it. We will look into this somewhat. Now you can construct about four storied building I mean conventionally up to four storied buildings uh, in many parts of the country are made of load bearing brickwork. Non load bearing works are, walls are the one which does not carry the load except the self load, but it provides the envelope, envelope in a let us say RCC framed structure. So the, in the infill between in the frame would be the brick. 
So, this brick works although may contribute to the structural stability somewhat, but basically we consider that they are not bearing the load, they have to only take the horizontal load, transverse load coming from wind local and they are self weight. So, these are the walls other than that piers where it has been used very few now retaining walls and arches there are many other similar structures where bricks work, brick work has been used. So, brick masonry has been used brick masonry or even stone masonry is dams, dams were there very much the arch dams or gravit dams stone masonry dams were there right. So, masonry structures we will see in the next class, but let us just introduce it we will see that you know we will we'll, we'll go back to this again maybe look into that. If you see the strength of the this axis is the strength of the compressive strength of the brick work or the masonry and this axis is the compressive strength of the mortar. So, compressive strength of the mortar this is mortar strength mortar strength mortar strength and this is the brick work strength the masonry strength brick work brick work strength. Now, orders if you see this is about this is in pounds you know from does not matter the units are if this is 3000 this is only 1000 or 500. So, strength of mortar increases the brick masonry brick work strength is much lower much lower than the mortar strength and by increasing the strength of the masonry beyond a point you do not get any I mean or the strength of the mortar you do not get any advantage. This is a lower strength brick this is a higher strength brick. So, as you increase the strength of the brick somewhere there is an increase, but you see mortar very strong mortar using strong mortar do not give you improvement in strength. We will look into this issue a little bit more uh, in details and you know in more in details in the next lecture. Similarly, just introduction to the masonry structures again if you have if you this is again this uh, this axis is strength of the brick work brick strength of the brick units this is the strength of the units and this side is the strength of the piers different piers actually sizes are different and what the point I am trying to make is you increase the strength of the brickwork it increases initially, but beyond a point it does not increase the strength very much the mortar used are same. So, there is a point beyond which it does not strength does not increase right ok and some idea regarding this and we will look into this in the next class as I said in more details you see this is the this is for the same strength of the brick now mortar strength this is the strength of the mortar this this lines show the strength of the mortar this lines show the strength of the mortar this shows strength of the mortar you know this mortar and this is the strength of the brick. So, as I go on increasing different mortars I used weak mortar brickwork strength for the same brickwork strength do not change. I can reduce the mortar strength, but brickwork change strength does not increase same thing different mortars have been shown here we will repeat this again in the next class when we look into the brickwork more. Okay. So, I think this is uh, we can summarize now we have looked into units and properties we have looked into mortars and properties and then just I have introduc introduced you the strength of the masonry we will look into the strength of the masonry and behavior of the masonry in the next lecture. Thank you.